Redux by Ron Linden. Both an exhibition and a gallery emerge anew and revisit it. It was more than a new season. September arrived, and with it, Redux entered. Ron Linden's bustling opening reception at Gallery 478 on a sun-drenched autumn day in San Pedro. Redux, as in a revisiting, is an appropriate name for two reasons. First, some of the works are older, starting from 2015 up to the present day. It's a sizable exhibition, with 17 works in total. But this revisiting also applies to Ron getting back to his lifelong work after a serious bout with the coronavirus, which had him in the hospital for one month earlier in 2023. Arnie. He asked me if I would be the first show to restart the gallery. And although I had reservations about it because I've been so connected to the gallery over the years, Ray and Arnie in tandem, I've curated shows in here and done other things with the two of them. And uh, she was pretty insistent, and so it was easy for me because all this work was in my studio down the street, so up it went. Just a kind of a reissue or revisiting. Yeah, they, they span a considerable period, really. Some of them go back, I think, to 2015, a couple. And then they go up to the present day, to 2023. So it's a mixed bag for sure. And then I have all of the small paintings above the counter. Those are all 2023. And the larger red one is 2023. And the uh, one that's right inside the door, that funny pecker nose guy, uh, that's 2022, I think. So it wasn't about dates or chronology, uh, the selection. It was about what paintings kind of live together. So it was mostly a visual decision all the way. I don't have any emotional attachment per se to the exhibition itself, but I've always said over the years that my goal is to try and make an image that is so fetching that you're going to want to get into it on first look and that the most important part is staying with it for the secondary or tertiary read. And I want the paintings to yield something more than that initial impression. I try to explain to students that the first response, you know, that emotional response where you look at something and you're attracted to it, before your brain rationalizes why it is you're attracted to it. Oh, it looks like this, or it feels like that, or it's about color, or it's pornographic, or it's whatever. But I try to explain to them that that is a good definition of the aesthetic response, is one where emotional response comes before kind of rationalizing what the image is or why you might be attracted to it. So I hope that these paintings work in that way, that there's a little bit of work to be done after the initial attraction of the image. Because there's a sense of humor in a lot of it, and I think it's important to have a sense of humor. When you read that John Berryman poem, it's got a sense of humor, but it's as morbid as you could imagine. But he was a great poet and teacher, and he was so particular that students would say that he could come and arrange the same words in a different order, in the same sentence or verse, and bing, it happened. I take those things seriously as a painter, too. And painting has a language of its own, obviously. But I've also said in the past when I'm cornered about it that I'm as inspired by what I read as by what I see. And that's true. If I could ever make a painting as succinct as that Berryman poem, I'd be a very happy guy. Maybe that's the kind of thing that painters look for all the time, is to have that quotient of enunciation where it couldn't be done less or more. During his opening reception, Ron discussed his series of 12-inch square works, titled Reboot, which is exactly what the series was for him. After my COVID experience, which was horrifying, happily I don't remember anything about it, 
but I was hospitalized for a month. And then when I got out, there was a lot of rehabbing to do. And at a certain point, I thought, well, I wonder if my hand and eye are on the same page anymore. So I bought those small canvases and just began with no preconceived notion of what I was going to paint or draw. But they wound up, the first few of them, looking like heads. A couple of them based on a stencil that I'd done of a, like a haberdasher's uh, dummy, you know, those wooden head dummies that they put hats on. And one of my pals noticed and said, oh, you're doing portraits. And so that kind of stuck in my head and I just went ahead with that and found that indeed my hand and I were still on the same page because I was kind of worried about that. It's important in drawing and painting how your mechanics are, so that's where the title came from. I also discovered at that time that even though I couldn't stand very long without leaning on something, I have a couple of drafting tables with tilt tops, and I could stand at the drafting table and I could work on things up to 30 inches. That was kind of good news too. That was encouraging. So now I'm inching up on larger formats where I'm more comfortable but I had an oddly rewarding time with those kind of head studies that make up that series. And some people totally got a kick out of them. I didn't anticipate that by just beginning from nowhere, really, because I didn't give a damn what I was going to do, what the subject was going to be. I just wanted to paint and draw and to see if my mechanics were still available because I've, I've always been interested in all that, the mechanics of making images, whether they're drawings or lithographic prints or paintings. I just found it so satisfying and rewarding that it took off, and now I purchased uh, some more small-scale canvases. Maybe a couple months ago I started them. It was right when I discovered that I could work at the tilted drafting table. Red Eye. Yeah, that's a new one. It's a funny painting to it, it has a sense of humor. It takes a while to find those beady little uh, substitutes for eyes, you know, that are lingering behind the frames. What was on my mind? A shuffle. You recognize those ellipse cutouts in like a frame? That used to be a format for framing photographs. This is going back to the 18th century, 19th century. You know, you would see a portrait of grandma and grandpa in one of those fucking oval frames, you know, they'd be standing in the center of it. And I have a couple of stencils that I cut like that. And then I just started to splay them out, almost like they were cards, right? And then uh, that opening at the bottom is like kind of implying that's where they'll all end up. And then a couple of them that are rendered as eyes are kind of surveying the situation or looking out. And that was the fun part of it, really. Red Eye is a playful piece that embodies movement. The detail of those beady little substitutes are at once haunting and humorous, looking out and almost looking back in. Because this jumps around over the course of the years, a lot of people hadn't seen certain of these paintings because they haven't been out in the public before. A few of them have, but an equal number or a little greater has not been out. Like that one at the beginning of a series that I did called Eye Spring, which is after a Man Ray piece. And out of that, I did many versions of Eye Spring. Anyway, it's ugly and I like it for that. Eye Spring 1, a literal image, features a lone eye at its base, from which shadowy branches spring like a geyser. And I like that gray painting too that hasn't been out of its cage for quite a while. That is uh, number 12, Friday Late. And that's made from a collage, a cut up collage. I work that way often. It's got a nice contemplative gray and then that dumb painted shadow in the upper right, I think, is pretty important to it also. That triangle in Friday Late rather veils the painting's geometric semicircles and earthy shades of black, brown, and hint of gold, 
uniting into a coherent seductiveness. To highlight all of this, a luxurious trio of dense black feather-shaped edges peak from its axis amid intersected spheres with what could be a cubic heart in gold in its center. Friday Late is a very satisfying painting. It's called clown time. It's hilarious. It's like a send-up of formalism. Taking kind of all the mechanics of geometric abstraction and turning them inside out yeah. is what I was thinking. Clown Time 1, the playful piece, juxtaposes surprising tongue-like forms that emerge, jut, and wag, supported by the mechanics of structure existing all together inside individual grayish-brown 3D frames like satirical cartoon panels. Here's what I have tried to talk Arnie into, that if we're going to be back in business, that I know some artists that also would make keen curators, right? And some young artists that I've known since they were students of mine. And so we can look forward to maybe a little unanticipated work by younger people. I did a couple of shows with a couple of students that I had at Harbor College that were just extremely gifted. We'll be able to get artists in here because this is a very accommodating space. We've shown sculpture in here in the past and we'll do that again. And it's absolutely fine for works even larger than mine, which we've shown. And it's good for photography and smaller works too. I mean, these walls, one, two, three walls move around. I'm glad that Arnie feels that way. I know her plate is full, but she insisted, and I think that it fills a need in her that's good for all of us. Arnie and I independently tallied up the people that we knew that were here, and there were like 71 people that we knew. And that's like kind of a new personal best, the new record for here. And a lot of interesting comments. I'm blessed with having a lot of gifted and smart friends. So that was good too, because even though I couldn't spend any real amount of time with any one person, there was still enough time for some interesting feedback. It made me a little skeptical because it was so positive. And that's important to me also. Ron will discuss his work December 9th from 4 to 7 p.m. at Gallery 478. You can see Redux by appointment in the meantime.